Okay, right guys, we're going to start then. So thank you for coming. Hopefully you can hear me. Good. Right. Um, so this is Jessie. Jessie Stowe. Um, she is an apprentice or has done a degree of apprenticeship and she's going to talk about um, that, her experience. So she says she's got questions for you now. So you can, yeah, that's good. Brilliant. Oh, so over to you, Jessie. Okay, thank you, Zoe. Um, so today I'm going to be giving a careers talk about working in uh, science, and that's especially in drug discovery and development, and also my experience as a science apprentice. So just a bit of an introduction to me and how I got here. Um, so back in 2015, I finished sixth form and I completed that with three A-levels. Um, around that time, so I had applied to go um, to university full time to study a chemistry degree. But in the summer after my A-levels, I was kind of umming and ahhing and deciding what to do. And I came across an apprenticeship in analytical chemistry. I didn't really know what it was, I'll be honest. I didn't really understand too much, but I knew that chemistry was cool. Um, and it mentioned some things that I'd heard of from my, uh, from my A-level studies. So I thought I'd give it a go and I applied. Um, I went to the interview and I was really, really lucky to have been offered the job. Uh, like I say, I didn't really have much of an understanding at the time of what, what it was. And also, I didn't really have any experience with apprenticeships. I didn't really know what to expect from it. At the time, someone telling me that I could get paid full time and that they would pay for my university studies as well seemed like it was worth the risk. So I took the job. Uh, so at that time, I took a job at a company called Takeda, um, which is based in Cambridge. And Alongside that, I started a foundation degree in chemical science with Manchester Metropolitan University. And that was a three year course, um, which is um, quite typically how they do degree apprenticeships. It's often split into phases of a foundation degree and then a uh, top up, I guess, to a bachelor's degree. After my first year at Takeda, they unfortunately decided to close their site in Cambridge, so I had to transfer but I really luckily found a new employer, which is Aztex, which is where I work now. And they employed me as a higher apprentice on a longer contract as well, up to 2020 that would end. And that allowed me to complete and graduate um, with my foundation degree from Manchester Metropolitan University in 2018. Straight on from that, I backed into a bachelor's degree. So this was a two year top up degree to get me to um, a first class honours degree. Um, and this was with the University of Kent, again, run as an apprentice apprenticeship. And that was in applied chemistry. And I finished that last year in 2020. I would say I graduated in the summer. I would just like to say I, I got a certificate because all graduations are still on hold thanks to COVID. Um, technically my contract with Aztecs finished at that time. I finished my apprenticeship but I was really grateful that Aztecs decided they wanted to keep me around and they hired me as a research scientist. So in five years, I went from being a A-level student, someone who finished at sixth form, um, to being a fully qualified and employed research scientist. Um, I decided then I wasn't quite ready to be finished with education. I asked Aztecs if they would support me in carrying on an apprenticeship and doing a, a master's level, which is pretty new actually. I'm one of the first people on the course, um, but this year I have enrolled in a master's degree in drug discovery, again with the University of Kent, and that should finish in 2022 next year. So still a bit of time left on that and I'm, I'm still going, but I'm enjoying it. Um, so that's me. So five years to a research scientist, and alongside that, I'm, I'm now about six years experience and that experience really is what has allowed me to progress onto the master's degree as well. Um, and I guess it's quite, it's quite important to say here that compared to being a full-time university student, that six years of experience can really make you stand out in the crowd. There's just some pictures here of real life drug discovery if anyone's interested, what the labs actually look like. So what is drug discovery? Um, I'm sure you've probably all heard more about it in the last 18 months than ever. So the goal of, of the drug discovery industry is to find a drug to help patients with an unmet medical need. So there are many different medical needs and many different um, diseases which currently need therapies. 
Um, but there are some really like key focuses within the industry. Um, and these are the diseases which you tend to see that are more widespread. So there's a big focus on finding alternatives to chemotherapy for cancer. So I'm sure many of you know that using chemotherapy as a treatment has some really, really devastating side effects. So we're trying to find um, therapies which are less, uh, less detrimental to patients' health as well, and also curing them for cancer. Another key area of focus is uh, diseases associated with ageing. So that's things like dementia, um, so Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, for example, so finding cures for those. Metabolic diseases are quite a big area, and that includes things like diabetes. And also there, um, there are investigations to try and find drugs for obesity as well, which is quite a common uh, disease of the modern world, I guess. And one I'm sure you're all very familiar with is uh, finding drugs for devastating viruses such as COVID-19, which I'm sure you all know the story of over the last 18 months. I don't need to go into that. So arguably, medicine is one of the, the most global and investable businesses in the world because it's something that affects people all over the world. And we're continually looking to develop uh, medicines in order to find the best therapies for patients. I put down here a chart which shows some of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world. So these, by biggest, um, this is ranked by their profits and their costs, essentially. So this dark blue line represents their costs of research and development, and the blue represents their sales. And this is in billion US dollars. That's a really huge scale. Um, the reason I've shown this, I guess, is to show the vast amount of investment that goes into this science. And the investment in the science also means investment in the scientists. So if you are interested in joining drug discovery, there is plenty of funding to help support you and invest in you if that's what you're interested in. Um, and being taking part in an apprenticeship scheme really makes the most of that too. Some of these companies you, you might have heard of or you might have heard of their products without realizing. So someone here, which I would expect you to hear of by now. So Pfizer and uh, AstraZeneca, for example, uh, the producers of the latest COVID vaccines. Um, and there's other companies on here which are pretty huge as well. So GSK or GlaxoSmithKline, when it's extended, um, produce things such as Panadol, which you've probably heard of, and also things like Sensodyne toothpaste. Um, and I know someone who used to work at the toothpaste site and she was never short of toothpaste. Um, and also companies like Pfizer, which produce a range of drugs, which I'm sure you've seen adverts for on TV, for example. Um, I guess a good point here, if you are interested as well, so companies like GSK and AstraZeneca have really fantastic apprenticeship schemes. So if you are interested at the end of this, I'd recommend looking in these two places. There's some really great opportunities. So how do we, how do we discover a drug? And I can talk to you about this from my company's perspective and how we do this in particular. So I work for a company called Aztex. And we focus on drug discovery and development for oncology, so that's cancer, and also for diseases of the central nervous system. So that um, includes diseases such as dementia, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, for example. So the, the key thing that we have to do in order to develop a drug is to first identify the biological target. And this is the biology and, and the factor in your body which is responsible for developing the disease. So for example, you can have a protein, which in a um, undiseased patient is normal, um, but can undergo some kind of mutation in order to lead to the onset of a disease such as cancer. Um, and what we try to do is we try to find a small molecule, so a small compound, which we can dose to patients and that will prevent that mutation from happening. Um, in order to prevent the onset of your disease, such as cancer. At Aztecs, we use something called fragment-based drug discovery, um, where instead of looking at fully elaborated compounds and seeing how they fit into the target, so this here represents the target being your protein, and we need to fit our compound into that, um, which you can use a fully elaborative, elaborated compound, which can fit, but perhaps isn't quite optimal. Aztecs looks at really tiny, tiny compounds or fragments, um, and then we find the optimal and best fit for those, and then we can piece them together in order to make them into a drug. 
So there are many stages in the drug discovery process. The first one being that we need to find our disease that requires a therapy. So for example, if you're looking at a cancer, you might want to focus on a pancreatic cancer, for example. You then look in detail at that cancer and you find the biological target and that is responsible for causing that cancer. So for example, in pancreatic cancer, you might want to drill down even further, find out exactly which protein is being mutated to cause that disease. Once we have our biological target, we can then look at those fragments and try to find what we call hits against the target. So we're looking at those fragments that fit into that target site, like I showed with those three structures before. We then optimise those hits to make them drug-like, so that means that we can link the fragments together and change their properties to make them more suitable and safe for patients too. Eventually, um, we will go and find our best compound. So this optimising stage isn't just a case of making one single compound, we make many compounds and then we have to pick the best one that we think has the best chance of really helping patients in the future. And then that compound will get submitted to clinical trials and um, where it gets tested in humans to find out if it's safe and also if it's effective at treating your disease. So I have some questions and I hope, uh, I hope you guys can answer from back there. Maybe Zoe can um, relay them to you and relay the answers. So my first one to you all is how long do you think it takes to develop a drug? So going from this process of identifying the disease and then putting that drug into humans and that being approved to be used. Yeah. So if you say now, 15-ish years. 15 years, yeah. Any other guesses? What? Uh, I heard that the COVID-19 drug took like, for some cases, like a couple of days or weeks and then the whole process of taking time was like the testing of it to make sure it was making it right. Mm -hmm. Sorry, could you hear yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, just about, yeah. Yeah, hang on, I'll move it a bit closer than you can say. Yeah, Sam was saying it, um, it just took a couple of days to identify it, but then the testing took a bit longer for the COVID-19 one, yeah, specifically. Yeah, exactly. So the COVID-19 vaccines, I'm sure you've heard of, are being called quick drug discovery, and, and it is. So when you look at the, the typical drug discovery process, it does typically take around 10 to 15 years to develop a drug. And someone did say about 15 years, so they were pretty bang on. So that means for you guys, a drug which gets approved on the market tomorrow um, is likely to have started work when you were a toddler. Um, so it is quite a long process. Would anybody like to guess how many compounds we have to make until we can get to the point where we select a single best compound? Possibly a little bit less than a thousand. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, not bad. So it, it's quite a lot. So the average drug requires around 10,000 compounds are made to make one single drug. So it's quite a lot of compounds we get through. Anybody like to guess how much it costs to make that single drug? Billions. Yeah, hundreds yeah, of millions. A billion. Billions, maybe, yeah. I reckon a billion. Yeah, you're all in around the right ballpark. It's about two billion US dollars to make a single drug on average. Yeah. And what do you think the likelihood is of a drug getting approved? So once we've selected our best compound and we put that into humans, what do you think the likelihood is of that compound being approved and getting used by um, as a medicine? Hopefully quite a lot because you've gone through a lot of testing and <laughs> taken your time. But it's probably very little. Probably reality. very little, yeah. Yeah, I think you'd, you'd expect it to be quite high, but it's about 10% of drugs pass at that stage. So almost 90% of drugs fail at this point. And bearing in mind, we've already gone through 10,000 compounds to get to that single one. And then they only have a 10% chance of passing at that point. So it's quite a, a long process. It's a very labor intensive process. And it's also quite high risk, I guess, as well, because the chance of your drug being approved is also quite slim. Um, but obviously we keep trying and we keep doing it because we really want to benefit the patients at the end. 
So what, what do I do at Aztec? What do my department do? So I work in drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics, and there's some really long words. Um, but what that essentially means is that we're looking at how the body affects the drug. So once you take that drug, what happens to it? Um, how does it get around the body? And how does it eventually leave the body? So if you imagine that you swallow a tablet, you take a drug such as paracetamol, for example, when you have a headache, um, what happens is that drug will reach your stomach um, and it will then pass through to your intestines. And the intestines is the main site of drug absorption in the body. So from there, um, any drug which cannot be absorbed into your body will be excreted. And any drug which can be absorbed and will pass through to the portal vein where it then reaches the liver. So the liver is the main site of drug metabolism in the body. Um, so the liver's main role is to break down those drugs. Um, and once they're broken down, they're readily excreted again. So you're losing drug again at this point. Any drug which survives metabolism can then pass through to systemic circulation. So then it can get around your body. And at that point, it can pass through and be distributed um, to the site of action. So using pancreatic cancer again as an example, at this point, your drug can get around the body and hopefully uh, get to the pancreas where, it, where the disease is and where it can really be affected, effective. So this describes the process of the absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion of drugs. And that's really what we look at on a day-to-day -day basis in my department. And it's really important to help determine how much drug you need and how long you need to take the drug for. And as I've put here, so only compounds which have good properties in each of these elements, so good absorption, good metabolism, good distribution, and have the chance to be an effective drug. What does my day-to-day -day role look like? Um, so I'm running experiments in order to model how the human body will affect the drug. Um, so I use um, cells in the lab in order to predict how well the compound will be absorbed from the intestines into the portal vein. I can also um, run models to determine how the compound will be metabolized by the liver. Um, so how much, how much of that drug will be excreted after metabolism and how much we'll be able to survive metabolism in order to reach systemic circulation. And there are just a couple of examples there. Um, I also have the opportunity to research and design new experiments, um, whatever the company requires or whatever kind of investigations we're looking into at the time. This is really useful. And actually throughout my bachelor's project, this was really useful as well, um, because it's a lot like carrying out a dissertation project. Um, which is something that you have to do for your bachelor's at the end. Um, but I'd actually had the chance to carry out numerous projects throughout my time at Aztecs. Um, and it was really great experience and practice for when I actually needed to be graded on a project like that. I report the data back to senior scientists. So I get to attend meetings. I give presentations to share my data with the wider team. And I also get to help make decisions about which compounds uh, look more promising and which compounds look more likely to become a drug. Additionally, I have a role in managing safety, so carrying out risk assessments um, and managing the safety in our lab as well. And the final point on here is that I get the opportunity to attend scientific training and conferences, um, and this gives me a chance to learn from top scientists in the field, and also gives me a chance to present my own research and work. And this is something which really stands out um, compared to going to full-time university, as I think a lot of full-time university students don't have the opportunity to do this. Um, but when you're employed at a company, it's something which we get to do quite often. And it's a really good experience and a, and a chance to network as well with other scientists. So that's kind of drug discovery and a bit of background on the industry. So I thought I'd just go into how does the apprenticeship actually work? So how, how did I carry out an apprenticeship whilst I was employed um, and working towards that research scientist role. So I spend 80% of my time at Aztecs um, doing my day-to-day -day work and then I spend 20% of your time with my training provider so that would be University of Kent for my bachelor's degree for example um, and what this means is that when you have a five-day week, a five-day working week, 
um, your company have to give you 20% of your time towards your apprenticeship. Um, and that is essentially having one day a week for your training. And that could be with a college or a university, for example. But that is a requirement. And you get paid for that time as well. So 20% of your work time, you're doing your university work or your college work. So that means that you don't have to really put any, well, I say you don't have to, but um, it means that your, your free time is your free time. You don't really have to do any homework or any work outside of that time unless you choose to. That's the idea. Um, I just thought I'd give a sort of update on the kind of variety of apprenticeships which are available um, and in particular for, for the STEM subjects. So there are a wide range of industries available. So I've spoken about drug discovery, which is laboratory research, but also there are apprenticeships in engineering and accountancy, for example. Apprentices don't just take the form of school or sixth form leavers anymore. Um, so you can also get university graduates and mature students as well who are looking to just expand their educational repertoire. For example, on my master's course at the moment, um, I've, I've joined straight after the bachelor's degree uh, apprenticeship, but the other people on my course have actually been working for a few years now um, in industry, but they've just decided that they now want to get a master's having completed their bachelor's a few years ago and now been in industry since then. The salary. So I think apprenticeships have um, some associations with being like really poorly paid. Um, but in general, I think a lot of the STEM related uh, apprenticeships offer a really healthy salary, sort of up to eight pounds an hour. And it's definitely livable and you have the chance to get promotions and progress your salary throughout that as well. In terms of the education, apprenticeships aren't just level two and three anymore. You can go all the way from a foundation degree to a bachelor's and a master's. Um, and I think even now they're working on PhD level apprenticeships too. So they are continually progressing. And lastly, the experience of being an apprentice is that it's a really hands-on experience. You get the chance to learn from both your university provider and also from your colleagues at work. You get thrown in as a valued member of teams and you get given training opportunities at work as well. And that can really help to develop you personally. So things like communication skills, for example, but also professionally. So learning um, skills and techniques, techniques which are relevant to your workplace. If you're interested at the end of this in finding an apprenticeship, I thought I'd just flag this. So there is a government apprenticeships website um, and it's called findanapprenticeship.com. And if you search that, you will find a long list of apprenticeships and you can search and refine by your area that you're interested in um, or a location if you if you wanted to live somewhere specifically and look for an apprenticeship down there. There's also a company called Cogent Skills and they focus mostly on STEM related apprenticeships um, and you can look through there to find any apprenticeship vacancies or additionally you can ask your school or college um, and recruitment sites also list apprenticeships, but they're perhaps a bit more difficult to find on here. So I would recommend looking through the government or coding skills or looking on recruitment sites. And when you apply, it's a lot like um, filling out a job application. So you complete an online application and then you'll be asked to go to an interview, most likely. So I'd just like to finish really on some of the benefits, I think, and, and the the pros of having an apprenticeship. So firstly, the learning opportunities really are incredible. So you have the chance to learn from both your employer and your training provider, and you get that hands-on experience. So you could learn something from your university studies and then have the chance to apply it in your workplace. And that really helps to consolidate your knowledge. And as well as that, you're learning some specific knowledge for your role. So when you, when I speak to, um, university students who have finished, they often say that they learned something in university, but they didn't really understand why or when they would ever have to use it. And then they come to work and all of a sudden everything comes clear and they, they learn that um, they can apply that knowledge to their day-to-day -day job. There is an enhanced employability associated with being an apprenticeship, apprentice, sorry. Um, so compared to a graduate who has had little or no experience in industry, um, at the end of your apprenticeship, you'll have really extensive experience. And I can say that personally, 
we've had students who have finished university, been employed at Aztecs, and it's been my role to teach them the job. Um, and even though some of those have technically been more qualified than me, they have masters already. Um, I'm the, I've been the one that's training them in the lab. You get contacts and references from within the industry, and that can help you when you're looking to progress your career, perhaps past your apprenticeship. And also, hopefully, um, at the end of your apprenticeship, you might get a job opportunity from your employer, which can be really beneficial. And the last point which I've put on here is that there is a huge financial benefit. So at the end of your apprenticeship, you can walk away with no student debts, and the whole time you've been an apprentice, you're earning while you learn as well. Um, so that can really set you up for your future as well. Um, so today I've given you a bit of an overview of drug discovery and what that is, uh, and also a bit of an insight on what it's like to be an apprentice. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. How long did your degree take you? The whole thing? Yeah. Um, so I start, it took me five years to get the bachelor's degree, just that chunk. Um, when you compare it to full-time university, obviously you can do it in three years. If you do a year in industry, it takes you four years. If you do five years in industry, it takes you five years. So I guess it depends on that balance between experience and the time it takes to actually get your degree. Yeah. Did you have... Um when you were doing it, so you have the one day a week in university, did you have blocks of time, you know, when you went to university to do practical and things like that? Or was it just the one day a week? Yeah, I did. So most of my learning was actually online. Um, so I didn't have like a day release as such. It was all sort of units posted online. But every now and again, so about every four to six months, we would have a week where we go to university and we do lab tasks and we have lectures and you get you get to go out and socialise a bit more with the people on your course. So it, I guess it's not the same as going to full-time university, but you still get the chance to go for a week and experience it. And it's still traditional, like sitting down and doing a test like you would normally if it was just a four-year degree or whatever. Yeah, so you have coursework and essays and literature reviews, for example, and then you also have exams. Um, so my exams are all set at work in this office um also at work and i had to assign someone at work to be my examiner essentially um so i assigned someone in hr and they had to sit with me through my exams and be responsible for coordinating the exam papers and then they send them back to the university to get graded Oh, I was going to say, last thing, um, do you think you missed out on the social life? Because that's a kind of big deal, isn't it, at university? Do you think you've missed out of that? Yeah, I think it's definitely different. Sometimes I feel like I missed out on the social side because I didn't have that kind of environment, I guess, where you, you live in student halls and then you go and get a house together. I didn't have that side of it. But equally, um, I did have friends who are here it's just a different experience because you're working the whole time and I also got the social side from work as well so you know have people at work who go out on the weekends and and you get social side from that I guess it's just not that uni social life experience yeah yeah thanks Jesse um I think we're done with questions yeah thanks so much again for coming coming back uh to long Road. um I've recorded um talk um so would you mind if i shared it with with the students who weren't able to come no that's fine that's yeah okay fine. that's brilliant yeah okay great thanks very much then thank you, thank you very much, yeah Rich. okay thank oh, simon you. said yeah simon's here as well thank you yeah. thank you very much <laughs> yeah yeah that's great okay thanks jesse um hope to see you again soon sometime yeah okay yeah have a nice day all right thank you bye bye